next debate, and people are just tuning in for it now, is about racism in the UK today and where we're at with a, with a specific emphasis on, on some of the issues, some of the guests we've invited to bring. So it gives me no great as to hand over to Kerry Ann, if I can, to start this session off. And uh, Kerry Ann, welcome to the Live Lounge and the Rebel Tent. Oh, it's lovely to see you, Glenn. Can I just check? Can you hear me? Yeah. You loud hear me. and clear, loud and clear. Awesome, fantastic. So are we going to kick off? Yeah. Yeah. Let's yeah. go. Yeah. Let's do it. So just welcome everybody who's joining us now. We're about to have a discussion, a roundtable discussion on racism in the UK today. We're going to try and have this conversation as naturally as possible, as if we were sitting together, having a chat about how things are. We're not going to be afraid to get personal. You know, there are people in this conversation who, for whom this isn't just some sort of theoretical debate. It's having real impacts on our lives. And I think by each of us sharing um, those very real circumstances, I think it helps people maybe who don't understand them to understand them a bit better. But it also helps people who are out there experiencing them know that they're not alone. So some areas that we're going to touch on are the position of black activists in the Labour Party today. Obviously, we've had the Labour leaks um, come out and there was a hell of a lot of racism in that. We'll go through that. Um, we're also going to look at coronavirus, massively disproportionate impacts on Bain communities from COVID-19. How, why, what are the issues? And we're also going to look at the 10 years of Tory austerity that has, again, disproportionately impacted Bain communities and we're going to look at what those impacts are, but also how we can fight them together. It's my absolute pleasure to introduce the panel to you now. We've got Fiona Lynch-Griffiths. Fiona's one of the co-founders of the Loop and Urban Radio. And this is an internet radio station and a social enterprise This based at Marsh House Social Action Hub in Luton. And as well as an awesome collection of musical talent, Fiona and the LUR team bring people together to just ponder on a wide range of issues that affect black people and crucially mobilizing to address them. So welcome Fiona. We've also got on the line Sai. Sai Philly is a rapper, local activist, member of one of the UK's most radical rap trios, Phil Life Cypher. Having opened the Brit Awards with PLC, Sai is currently working with co-pilot Life MC and Napa, PLC producer on the latest album. So I was inspired to join the Labour Party when Corbyn took the reins, but like many others, not happy with the latest developments. So welcome, Sai. Really, really great to have you tonight. Um, I think Sai might need to like trot off at seven. So if he goes, he hasn't run away. <laughs> we can only keep him until about seven o'clock. I oh, will say goodbye though, yeah? Don't worry. Damn right, mate. You better. <laughs> <laughs> And it is also my massive pleasure and honour to introduce a personal hero of mine, Jackie Walker. Jackie is a political activist. She's a writer. She's a teacher and an anti-racism trainer. She's the author of a family memoir called Pilgrim State. If you have not read it, read it. It's amazing. And she's also a co-writer and performer of a one-woman show, which is The Lynching. Again, really, really powerful play. Get to it if you can. She's held roles of vice chair of South Thanet Constituency Labour Party and has been the vice chair of Momentum before being suspended and ultimately expelled from the party for misconduct. <laughs> so that's our panel. Welcome, everybody. I guess we can start off looking at the Labour Party. Um, how is everyone feeling? I guess if we start with Fiona. Um, on paper... <laughs> our new leader I should be so enthralled and happy and but I'm scared I'm honestly I'm more than scared I'm really confused by it all I mean we've we've lost Jeremy and <laughs> the difference between them I know everyone's different and I know every leader is different but the difference between Corbynism and Starmerism it, it frightens me and I'm, I'm I'm confused to be honest and you know I work in an industry that if I probably said this out loud I'd be fired right um but I'm really scared I'm particularly scared be, 
especially with the times that we're in, because we keep saying it, we, we keep talking about hope um, when all of this ends. And I know that it's not going to last forever, but I just don't think with the leader that we have now is what I personally and my family personally and the people around me, what we, what we need. So I'm confused and I'm worried. Thanks, Fiona. Um, Jackie. Hi. I mean, I'm, I'm not confused. I'm livid and I'm outraged that we now have a leader of a party that has nothing to do with me and my aspirations, mm. not as a socialist, and certainly not as a black woman, mm. certainly not as a black person, somebody for whom the hierarchy of racism, which exists, which is one of the reasons that I was expelled, by the way, for saying that there is a hierarchy and people of colour and Muslims are at the bottom of that hierarchy. This person who dares point the finger at people and call them racist has, has actually, for example, protected the people who were racially abusive to black members of parliament and to me. That was something that the report didn't disclose and has protected those people while smacking, that's what he did, our primary black women MPs who have had the most abuse of all the MPs put together, and those are the ones who get smacked on the hands. The obvious, the obvious anti-black racism is, is, is just making me absolutely livid. So I'm not confused about this, I'm afraid. I'm just really angry about it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I share that anger as well. Jackie, I think we were, uh, we're often found on Twitter venting our spleens <laughs> about what's, what's been going on with this. Um, Sai, did you want to chip in about it? I'll mute myself, sorry about that. Um, yeah, for me, I'm, I'm a kind of simple man still. I always kind of relate back to when I was a U, I supported England because of Kevin Keegan. I supported Ian, I supported Arsenal because of Ian Wright, and I supported mm. Labour Party because of Jeremy Corbyn. Yeah, he was the only politician that had ever appealed to me as far as to me. That's the first time I'd ever even voted in my life. Yeah, I'm, I'm wow. 45 years now old now. The only reason I voted was because of Jeremy Corbyn and the policies he was talking about. And for me, it was a complete change of what I'd seen previously to that. Do you know what I mean? And when I see him in, in, in PM's question time, whatever not, he was the only one who was talking for me and talking about my, the kind of situations that I wanted to be, the things I wanted to be talking about. And then still not, I don't even know why they call it PM's questions because no one answers any questions. It doesn't make any sense to me. So then because of, I've known Tommy Corby and his son for quite a while as well. And for me, the thing that actually made it real was the fact that the relationship I had with a potential prime minister's son meant that if something's going on, I can be like, calling up Tommy and be like, yo, Tommy, what's your dad dealing with? What's, what's going on? Yeah. I can't call Boris Johnson's son. I can't call Theresa May's child if she had one. I can't call any prime minister. I mean, and for me, it's the first thing that, sorry, that's my, that's my door slamming there. For me, it was the first politician that actually made politics real for me, yeah? And something that made it accessible for pe people like me and myself and my children for a better future. And rather than the, the mess that we've been going through for how many years of a conservative government and a Labour conservative government as well, which is what we've got technically right now anyway. So yeah. the only thing for me right now is the fact that I know Keir Starmer knows what he's doing when he's questioning someone. He still looks a little bit awkward when he's doing, when he's asking questions or whatever or not, but the fact that it's in this pandemic time right now, we haven't got Boris Johnson's cheerleaders all in the background mm. making it look a lot worse, I mean, a lot better for them than it actually is. I mean, you basically got, you, they're left to say what it is that they've got to say and then Keir Starmer just coming back and asking the same question again and saying, from the fact he can say, I think you missed the point, you need to answer the question again. That's That for me is a bonus, but I can't put my trust in somebody who I've thought I don't, I don't have enough knowledge on Keir Starmer and, and it's often, you know, when your spirit just doesn't take to someone. <laughs> and it's just that my spirit just doesn't take to him. Do you know what I mean? And yeah. he just, for me, he just feels like another Tony Blair in the Labour Party, which is why I didn't pay any attention to politics in the first place. Yeah. I don't know about you guys, but I'm feeling particularly gaslit by the Labour Party right now. <clears throat> yeah. Um, 
And I think two examples for me, one would be not just what we all read in the Labour leaks, you know, the moments that stuck out for me was the language about Dawn Butler. It was, you know, the fact that, you know, Diane Abbott's in the toilets crying because of abuse she's received. And these people are like laughing about it and getting sending journalists in to embarrass her and, and make a public spectacle of it. Just it sick of me to my core, I think partly because and you guys are probably the same, we've had experiences like this in our lives where people were, you know, being superficially friendly to our faces and then behind us participating in these stereotypes about us. Mm -hmm. And we knew it's happening, you know, and then it was almost like reading that report it was like, this is, this is what they're really like. This is what they're like with their masks off. And we don't often get to be in those conversations because they take place when we're not in the room. So it was the report itself, but almost more than that, actually, it was the reaction to the report or the complete lack of, a, of any reaction to the report, you know, especially when you consider the hysterical reaction to, to things that were not even, in the opinions of Jewish people, anti-Semitic, you know, but there was this hyperbolic, hysterical response to that. And then you have these real classic, no tropes, straight out, flat out, anyone can see it, racist, you know, dialogues happening. And action's happening, and then it's like, well, what ifs? You know, shrug of the shoulders, and then crickets. And the second thing um, is the immigration bill. You know, for, for people listening, the Conservatives are trying to pass one of the most racist pieces of legislation we've had since the Blair era, and that's saying something, because that was, you know, the, the laws that were passed um, during Tony Blair's reign is just, you know, beggar's belief. We have this immigration bill and having spent months, page? if not years, That's people like Yvette page. Cooper lecturing us, mm -hmm. people of colour, that we didn't understand racism because we weren't willing to watch anti-Semitism be weaponised on behalf of a racist project. And then there's Yvette up in the House of Commons saying she's going to vote with the Tories because she understands the need for this racist policy. And it's just complete gaslighting from beginning to end with these people where it feels to me like they only give two shits about racism when they can weaponize it in order to advance some little project that they've got going. And when it actually comes to really tackling racism, standing with us, making a difference, they don't only seem to not support us, they seem to actively agitate against us. Like what has been the impact on you guys of that? And, you know, feel free, speak away. I, I won't call people yeah. in. Just go for it. Can I just say, I mean, as a Palestinian within the Labour Party, I actually agree with Jackie. You know, I'm not confused at all. In fact, even with Corwin in power as, a, as our leader, uh, the thing, these things that we see in the, in the report were going on. But as a Palestinian, it's very difficult within the Labour Party because mm. to understand this anti-Semitic weaponization. I mean, it, it is actually the anti-Semitic, the whole attacks were actually racist. As a Palestinian, mm. those, everything that was happening made me feel as if because I'm a Palestinian, I'm not welcome. And that is racism. And, you know, and it's so important because a lot of the pressure, there's no doubt about it, a lot of the pressure came from the, the right-wing Zionist movements, the BOD to, to, the, to the other, other campaigns which are going, we all know about. And, and, and they, they, they are not, they're not representative of Jewish people in this, in, in, in this country or anywhere. And yet they claim to be, they claim this, this, special, this special right to go and tell people what is anti-Semitic. And in the process, they are actually being anti-Semitic themselves because they drive, not only they're driving a wedge for colonialism within, within an apartheid state in Israel, they, 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 they're making Palestinians seem as lesser people and it's okay if anything happens to them, take their land still, doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it's all, it's all coming around to what, what, you know, the same things that we all talk about. I mean, for black people, the, the whole BME, uh, maybe, um, uh, community within the Labour Party and, and, and outside, are feeling the same things now because you've got a, you know, you've got a leadership. You know, it's 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 a funny leadership because leaders come and go and pe things change in the Labour Party. Also, I always say to everybody, look, you know, we 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 don't like Stam, we don't trust him. But on the other hand, we have the left have united in the past. The left have been able to 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 to, to act sensibly and, and and effectively as a unified force and actually has won things within the Labour Party. I think the the Corbyn era is, is one testament to the fact of what the power of the left can actually achieve and the members can achieve fighting in the unions for a good policies for the right the right socialist uh, future that we're, we're all aiming for and and the anti-racist uh, fight as well 
And, and I don't think we're, we're losing the battle. Just because we've lost one battle, we haven't lost the war. And I feel uncomfortable within the Labour Party, of course, as a Palestinian. And I know others, I mean, I'd love to have Jackie back in again. And, and that's one of our tasks, to get people like Jackie back into the Labour Party. But ultimately, we have to just unite, even within the Labour Party, outside the Labour Party, you know, with Jackie, with others, fight together and, and demand that racism is defeated, that we have an international policy which is anti-colonialist. That means uh, supporting BDS against uh, Israel. Uh, and, and and any other any other imperialist activity around the world, we are at the forefront of showing that internationalism. You don't have the only way racism can be defeated by actually winning the the the, the war, winning the winning the, the ideology that needs to be out there. Can I just say, I I don't think it's a coincidence, by the way, that they were so scared about activists of colour joining with Palestinians, because they've always historically being scared of oppressed people getting together and working in solidarity. But what has been revealed to me in a way that is, I suppose, you know, I first, I came to this country on a boat, I'm that Windrush generation in 1959, when the racism was really in your face, it was spat in your face. It was put like shit as shit through your door. Now that doesn't happen to me anymore in London. I live in an area which has got 50% people of colour. And in a way, I think, I was sort of, I was a bit made comfortable by that. I mean, I knew what happened outside London because I also lived outside London, but I was made a bit comfortable by this liberal gloss, the liberal gloss that is the majority of the parliamentary party. And underneath that, this racism is a racism that says, you don't have any power, we don't care. And they're right, because we don't have the media, we don't have, I mean, the board of deputies, if you think that there are about a quarter of a million Jews in the whole country, most of whom are not observant. So who the hell are they actually representing in the end? And, you know, if you think about that, that this tiny group of people, not because they're Jewish, but because they're Zionists, can actually have that level of leverage within our establishment. And where, for example, the people of colour who make up two to three million of the population have this, not just this little power, but can be treated with such disdain. And I think actually stage one, and I think we should see this as stage one, is actually understanding as people of color, as Muslim people, as Palestinian people, as oppressed people, how little we matter to those people. We need to get that through our heads. We matter very little apart from as window dressing. Now that's stage one. At some point we've got, on to, got to get onto stage two. What do we do about it? I think, you, look, I, I wish I could disagree with what you've both said. Um, as a child born in the 70s, I feel that black people, we're actually going backwards in terms of, yeah. We're not even allowed to call racism out now. And <laughs> whenever I talk to, not whenever, but a lot of the time when I talk about racism to people, and not just white people, you know, people of colour as well, well, I'm always questioned, well, is that actually racism? Are you sure? And I've never really noticed that before the last few years I've kind of noticed, right, that obvious, for me, what I obviously deem as racist acts, whether it's down to housing, socioeconomics, the difference in how we are treated, the fact that people are even question the fact, well, are you sure that's racism? For me, that just says to me, we're not being taken seriously. And as you rightly said, Jackie, we have no power, we have no say. And when someone 
is telling you that what you deem to be racist isn't in fact racist, what, how can you even address anything when they're taking that away from you as well? You know, and, and to me, it just reminds me of like going to secondary school in the 80s and, you know, that there was that saying about having a chip on your shoulder. We've just gone back to that, right? Well, you've got a chip on your shoulder, but we're not saying that, but we're just saying, well, no, that's actually, that's not racism. That's something else. And yeah. And I think yeah. that's why I keep, I keep using that word confused because I just don't see how we're here in 2020. How are we back to this place where we've got chips on our shoulders when the evidence is clear? I mean, we're in COVID now and we've been told that the people that are being most effect- who are actually dying more than anyone else are people of colour, people on the front line that are literally cleaning up the, the, the shit and trying to keep people alive. These are the people that are dying. And when you ask the question, well, why are these people dying in, in more numbers than their white counterparts? Is that not racist? Well, no, it's not racism. So what is it? So I'm co- that's yeah. why I keep saying I'm confused. Well, I think what they like to tell us, Fiona, is it's because we got these awful diets and we're very unhealthy. Yeah, that's and right. We don't, and I'm we don't waiting walk. to hear what they're going to say. So we're so, you know, we're so decivilized. you know? Of course right. we're going to die more of COVID. I mean, it's insane, but we, we will come back to that, I think, because we, we need to definitely go through that whole COVID situation in detail because there are there is so much racism attached, as you're right, not only to the causes of the increased fatalities in in vain people of this but in the reaction to it um but one more thing i wanted to touch on with the labor stuff before we move on to covid is something i found particularly disheartening and actually kind of left me feeling quite lonely and sort of alienated from the labor movement for a little while in the wake of the 2019 election defeat and there was this conversation that started which was Basically, Corbyn spent too much time on, you know, fringe issues like racism. And he really needed to appeal more to the traditional working class voter in the Labour heartlands. And I'm like, if there's a bigger Labour heartland in Black Britain, I don't know (laughs) where it is. That is a massive constituency for the Labour Party. It's almost universally um, Black people vote for the Labour Party. You know, it's very tough to find yourself a black Tory. And you're there thinking, and then they're they're saying to us, you know, you you gotta, you know, you gotta stop making this about race. You you gotta put down your issues about race and you gotta focus on these class issues as if these things are in competition with each other. And you know, my my take personally on that is that's your job, mate. Because actually, black people have been putting aside racial issues to fight for class issues since forever. It is definitively white people who look at people of colour and don't see working class brothers and sisters. They see competition for their jobs. They see whatever scary idea they got about people of colour, whether it's a brown person, they're a Muslim, if a black person, they're some sort of criminal drug dealer, whatever it is. And I just find it enormously frustrating to have that projection that gross act of projection of their issues onto us along with some type of culpability for daring to ask to be represented on an equal footing like how how can i just correct one 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 thing that you just said there because i agree with virtually everything except they were happy to talk about race but only one form of racism and it's a racism. I mean, I'm black and Jewish, yeah. but yeah. actually it's a racism that affects a group of people who are mostly white. And not only that, it's a group of people, i.e. Jews, who are mostly white and mostly in no way structurally oppressed. Yes, they're subject to bigotry, but they are in no way excluded from power or privilege in this country. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right, I was expelled for saying that, so I can say it now. Yeah, because sorry, can I just say one thing here, right? What you just said there, right? It's racism, right? Why 
has anti-Semitism got its own word for racism in itself? That's, that's what I don't understand. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, I'm telling you why. I'm telling you why. Because there's only one conversation you can have about racism, and that's when it affects white people who are not oppressed, <laughs> which okay. is why the Telegraph and the Express and the BBC and the bloody right wing of the Labour Party want to talk about anti-Semitism. You will right. never hear them saying, I'm not talking about anti-Semitism. Anti I'm sorry, I've had enough of anti-Semitism. But can I tell you, I have had it up to here of hearing about this, what for me as a black woman are a group of mostly privileged people whining on about the fact that actually in the end, they've got pretty good entrance into the best facilities for education, housing, in the media and in every other form of business. And I want to say, shut the up about mm. that. <laughs> Real talk. Mm. Here, here. That's the privilege of not being in the Labour Party. I can actually tell the truth. And I can tell the truth that almost every black person is thinking today that almost I would think every Palestinian, every Muslim person is thinking today. And I will tell the Labour Party, there will be a cost to pay for this. Mm -hmm. There will be a cost because just like you're saying, actually it's people of colour who support the Labour Party disproportionately. The Labour heartlands are in the urban areas and wow. that is us. It is people of colour. And get yourselves together, mate, because otherwise you're going to lose everything. Right. But where do we go? Where do we go? It's a good question. I, I, I just feel lost, right? I think there's, there is anti-racist campaigns, which is not within the Labour Party. Obviously, the Labour Party people like myself involved like the uh, and Diane Abbott and others were very strongly involved in that and well, we have to build those movements we've got I mean I was I'm a child of the 70s when when the anti-Nazi league and and and, and all that stuff was going on and was really active of course that was in power with the the um the anti-apartheid stuff that was going on and I think the lessons from all those those times is that unity is strength we've got to build those movements we really be seen together outside the Labour Party, but also inside the Labour Party. There are good groups in this. I mean, as a Palestinian, there's, 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 there's good groups being set up uh, and, and, and active. And, and, and they're also, you know, not just the Palestinian issues, all, for all black people, Asians, blacks, and everybody, all, all the BME uh, people, there is ways we can actually organise. And I don't think we should, should be too despondent. And I understand the anger mm -hmm. from Jackie. I mean, I, I have it myself. But then you have to sit back and think, well, as you said, why, what do we do? And, and I think there are lessons. We shouldn't be strong. We're not going to be strong and winning every single battle. It's going to be a long. It's going to be a long haul. But I think we'll talk about the coronavirus. But I think in some ways that gives us some some uh, leeway. I mean, we've already had the the, the Tories have only half effectively uh, going back on on the fact that black people have to pay twice uh, for the right <laughs> test care. Um, <laughs> I mean, but only <laughs> You know, the next thing you're going to say, if you're black, I, you must be a fraudulent and you're not really a care worker in NHS work. <laughs> well, then you don't get it for six weeks. You know? Anyway, that's another thing. But uh, I think, you know, we're going to see all these things uh, happening. But we just have to be patient, a little bit patient. I mean, you know, when you've been around, you know, in the 60s, 70s, and you, uh, you know, and it all was also younger, yeah, I understand, because I was impatient, very impatient when I was young. You wanted everything to be fixed tomorrow, you know. But that's, that's natural. But we do have to sit back and think, organisation, it won't be tomorrow we'll do it, but there's opportunities. Build them, build the fight back, you know, inside and outside the Labour Party and, and really start, start working on it. And I think, you know, it's true that, you know, you, you said about, you know, have, have black people always been active on, 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 the, on the class issues? Of course we have. And then it's, yeah. it's an insult to say that, you know, are we doing to come to these? And I know, do know the people on the left, unfortunately, some of them think like that. Uh, mm. I remember the days of the militant and, and their views on it, you know, it was a diversion of racism. And, and that was awful. Um, I didn't support them being kicked out, but and some of their policies were, uh, you know, very questionable. But 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 that that's that can be defeated. That's by by us arguing by by being there. But also when we start being active outside, 
really fighting, fighting the right, uh, being there whenever they pop up. Uh, in Luton, it's pretty good, the, 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 the movement. Yeah, I'm sure, sure in London, it's pretty good. But there are problems elsewhere, you know, where the, the, the campaign isn't strong and we need to build it up. But I think we can win because I think the one thing that this, this whole thing is that what we're going to go back to, people have seen now that neoliberalism, capitalism isn't, isn't a good system. You know, we're going to have so many unemployed. You, you've got what's going to happen in the States. And unfortunately, we're going to be careful because that can lead to fascism as well. Yeah. But yeah. that's why racism, the fight against racism is fundamental. But I want to see that these movements, something like the Anti-Nazi League, and the success of that. Um, you know, there are people who, who criticised it, but hey, you know, they, they were very big and very successful. They have one of the biggest anti-racist marches ever in London. You know, and we've got to reset. How, does, how do they do that? Bring that back and let's learn the lessons. Now, the far right isn't as big, you know, as they were then, or prominent. But that doesn't mean we have to fake, you know, have a far right uh, beacon to, to attack. We can attack the Tories because they're just as racist. Yeah. Thanks, Tarek. I'd actually agree with you. I think mobilising is really important, and I think mobilising, you know, as as all of our constituencies, you know, with all of our individual in, interests represented, because we all experience racism in different ways, and I think it's important to acknowledge that we have there are common themes, but we also are subject to different styles of racism at, at different points in time. Um, but also being able to bring ourselves together and harness that power of numbers. The second point is that is a lesson that I learned quite bitterly actually during the Corbyn era which was I felt like one of the biggest mistakes and sort of kind of unpleasant behaviors that I saw from the leadership team during Corbyn's era was their tendency to reward enemies and yeah. punish friends yeah. so they seemed always to cater for the people that seemed most hostile to them while mm -hmm. taken entirely for granted people who were there supporting them, even advocating against supporter interests on behalf of people who were actually committed to the party's de destruction, quite literally. So I actually think we need to get our backbone in order with this. And actually, I think a lot of us have actually internalized a sort of acceptance bordering, not bordering, it's gone into resignation of like, "'Twas ever thus, you know, we're always gonna be at the back of the bus. Um, you know, whatever, but at least it's better than the Tories. And I don't know about you guys, but I am so done with that attitude now. It is over. Like that level of complacency from me is dead. You know, that, I will be fighting the Labour Party tooth and nail on these issues crazy. moving forward. Yeah. And I think we have to, because if we don't, they will just, you know, as the quieter we are, they're like, great, they've shut up. Right, let's just carry on with what we were doing. That complacency that you just spoke about is rife amongst people yeah. of my age. Well, not just my age, actually, but amongst a lot of people that I know. They're just resigned to this is where we are, you know, when it's not going to get any better. This is it. This, the thing is, that's how I feel. That's, I feel literally like, you know what, whatever support I had for politics and voting and trying to make change for that, I tried to do that over the last few times that I tried to vote. Do you know what I mean? And I got shown each and every time that it doesn't matter. Yeah. yeah. The only reason I, the, the only reason I had a reason to vote was because of Jeremy Corbyn. For me right. to vote for Keir Starmer, I'm not voting for something that I actually I haven't even heard his policies or anything like that yet. But for me, moving forward, I know all I'm going to be doing is voting for the same thing that was that was happening with Tony Blair and everything back in the day, whatever. Not and it's not going to be. It could even be worse or whatever. But for me, politics is so broken. It's got to the point where we just need to actually govern ourselves, police ourselves, and literally just have exactly what like Exodus and Leviticus have been trying to do for the like to build our own communities and, and put some unity in community and actually yeah. deal with ourselves. Do you know what I mean? Because they don't care and whatever they're doing for us is not gonna be for us, it's gonna be for them. Do you know what I mean? So right. unless we start looking after ourselves, I'm not gonna continue following whatever they're saying I'm thinking with, with, with whatever politicians are saying or whatever not because it, most of the time it never comes true and it, you end up just basically looking like a lunatic for looking I remember when Jeremy Corbyn was talking about free internet and going and people were there talking about it like it was crazy why are you talking about free internet I bet everyone's begging for free internet right now with lockdown yeah that's right yeah, <laughs> yeah do you know what I mean and that's a simple thing you go over Europe they've got free internet all over the place they've had it for years 
I mean, their whole train system and everything is completely different. And it's been like that for years. You can travel from one part of France to the other part of France for a fraction of what you pay over here. It's been like that for years. Why are we building HS2? Because <laughs> the middle class white people want it. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to say something a bit, you know, how I, how I started to think, and I'm sure this is going to upset some people. Um, I'm, I'm we've, got, we've got to find some way of leverage in the Labour Party. And mm. one thing I would say is that I'd like to think that we could just go on and, you know, like, work within those structures you, you were talking about with Diane Abbott, but I also register the way that Diane responded yeah. when Keir Starmer reprimanded her for yeah. doing something that wasn't wrong at all. And actually what happened is that the black membership and the supporters of the black membership were undermined by that. Yeah. That was hugely destructive from that. And I'm beginning to think that we cannot anymore just keep going, do you know what? If we're really good niggers, if we keep on just going to the doors and knocking and singing the right songs and doing the whole thing, they will reward us in the end. Yeah. History teaches us a different lesson. Right. Right. History teaches us that there is one way that change comes, and that is if you get proper leverage. Now, the black community does not have money. The black community does not have access to the levers of power. It does not have access to the media. It has one political power, and that is its vote. That is its vote. Now, we've already been talking about the fact that in urban areas, labor is carried by the black vote. In this area, mm. in the last couple of elections, it made my heart cry. There were women coming in out of night duty, carrying big bags of shopping, black women with their children, waiting, queuing up for hours to vote for a party that basically ignored their interests as black right. people, right? Now, for example, in the constituency I'm in, which is a very safe, it's very safe because it's in a London. The black people and the white people vote Labour. It's totally safe. Now, what would happen in those constituencies if 20% of the black vote didn't turn out? Yeah. Suddenly, the Labour Party would listen. I'm not saying to do it everywhere, but mm. I'm wondering whether what we should be looking at is a campaign that up front says to the Labour Party, in certain constituencies, in certain safe Labour seats, we are going to encourage people not to vote Labour. Not to vote Tory either, but yeah. not to vote Labour. And I'll tell you something, I don't know if it would work in terms of getting people to do that. It's happening anyway. I have to tell you, what I'm hearing from black brothers and sisters yeah. is I'm not going to vote Labour anymore. Right, right. What happened? They lost 20% of that vote. Because I tell you, even Keir Starmer would start to listen. Yeah. yeah. That's Absolutely. a powerful point. Cause it's, yeah, because it's not just about... I think that's the difference that you're talking about, Jackie. It's not just the quiet withdrawal. Like, I'm just quietly going to not vote next time. Like, right. this really needs to be vocalised. You know, this is a protest. It's not an act of giving up or surrender. Yeah. It's yeah. actually an act of, it's a fight. It's like, listen, it, you're not paying attention. It's a strategic boycott to yeah. put pressure on an organisation which has shown itself evidentially to be structurally racist mm. against key supporters. I think, I think one thing a little bit caution. I mean, I can understand where you're coming from, Jackie, and I think, I think in many ways that what you're saying is going to happen anyway. Uh, I, I would always say that. I mean, I would never really want to have uh, the Tories back in 
uh, by default. And, and I think that's one of the worries yeah. because they are the Labour any better. Well, it's not so much that Labour might be better, but what Labour wins that makes people more active, more, more, more wanting to see things. But I think, but more important, I mean, I'm not saying that that won't happen, that will happen. I don't think we should do, think that, I, I can't see a campaign winning uh, by just doing that. The reasons are twofold. One is that I don't think that the number of BME people in, 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 in the UK is really, I mean, this is just a fact. It's not, they're not enough numbers to really have a, we don't have power elsewhere. I know you're saying we don't have, because you have you know, some constituents, Luton could, could, could change, parts of London could change. But the thing is, this is the way I'm coming from. It's a double-edged uh, sword here because because the, the other side of this is that Labour could become more, more extrinsically racist because they, they're saying places in the North England where literally they, they're bemoaning the fact that, that and the surprise that white racists voted for the Tories. And let's be honest, most of the people up there, and my sister lives up there and knows them, even within the Labour Party, are white racists. And the fact is that they turn to the Tories on a basically racist platform. And the thing is, the Labour could turn around and say, OK, to the black people, because they, they have no interest, the, the, the white, uh, the, the white uh, leadership have no interest in the black cause at the moment. And if they, if they see an opportunity to win enough seats on a racist platform, and this has happened in other places where Labour Party, so-called Labour parties have moved well to the right, it could happen here. And I think you might find a situation where even Blair as it looks like these idiots who you saw in, 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 the, in the report would suddenly have more power. And if they get in power, they'd be quite happy to put a racist program uh, policy out there. Yeah. I mean, this is, this is I'm not saying this will happen, but we have to be careful. Can, so, I, can, yeah, I, can, I, can I just point out two things which you've missed? I said to do it strategically okay. in certain constituencies. Now, you could put a donkey up <laughs> Lewisham. And if it had a Labour badge on it, it would win. That's the bottom line. I'm not saying do it everywhere. Mm. And actually, you've just proven my point. Mm. The Labour Party are listening to the white racists because the white racists have stopped voting for them. You right. proved my point. The mm -hmm. only leverage we have is if, if suddenly, you know, all these pretty white women... Mm. In Lewisham, in the whole of the four Lewisham constituencies, which are 50% black, the most recent um, MP selected last year, not one black MP, not one black MP. Now, if they thought they were going to lose the black vote, that would change. So what I'm asking Hi. for is not everywhere, it's a strategic boycott which actually says it actually looks at sp particular constituencies and it tells the Labour Party we are Labour voters but we will not vote for you until this changes because the alternative is and I'm telling you this is mm. that black people will stop voting in any case yeah okay yeah. I mean can I just come yeah. out I mean I, I, I'm I don't disagree with you at all, Jackie, what you're saying, really, but I think the, where I was really trying to come to in the end, and I probably took too long, sorry, the, the real issue is without strong anti-racialist black-led movement, okay, behind any such strategy, anything, I think that's where the danger is. In other words, if we're not politically and, and organisationally strong within the communities, within Britain, within the Labour Party, with every, every facet of, of, of political life, you have a dangerous situation where, yes, black people probably still won't go out and vote. It will actually happen. They will lose votes. But there'll be nowhere for them to go. There's nowhere, no, no direction for them to go. And so, yes, it'll happen, but it'll happen in a way which then turn, the Labour Party can turn away from them easier. And that's what I'm saying. It's happened in the past. It's happened in other places uh, where, where we've done that. And, and I think we just be careful. I agree we're doing it, but we have to have a strong movement behind it. We can't just do it in a vacuum. Agree. We have to have a strong movement behind it. And that's yeah. what we, enough, I'm fed up of going out on anti-racist marches, facing the far right, having them spit at me, and then having <laughs> Zionist racists call me a racist when they've never, ever been on those struggles before. Exactly. I'm not prepared yeah. to do that anymore. I am not prepared to give the Labour Party a free pass mm. to treat black people the way they do. 
So if I would call for a powerful movement, and I tell you something, if instead of going, you know, what we're going to do, I'm not saying we shouldn't do it, is, you know, uh, go and have uh, uh, marches against anti-racists. But if we actually had a powerful movement that did that, you'd have the media, you'd mm. have the Labour Party, even before an election, yeah. listen to black people. That's awesome. Thank you so much, guys. I think we need to um, move on to the next section of tonight's talk. But the feedback we're getting in the comment section is just people are really, really respecting these voices and these opinions. And as Jackie said earlier, this is a conversation that I know a lot of people not of colour <laughs> um, might never have heard this conversation because, you know, I know for myself, like there is you know, during the anti-Semitism kind of smear campaign, you know, while it's at its height, and let's not kid ourselves, it ain't gone away. Um, you know, I remember me and Jackie talking on the phone about it at one point and being like, do they not realise how angry, you know, yeah. Muslims are, how angry black people are? You know, that this is a real massive issue that's coming up and, and nobody seems to know about it. And I think in part because we're almost scared to talk about it to anyone because we're already being called racist. As it, as it is, um, so yeah, so thank you everyone for for wearing your hearts on your sleeve and being unafraid to have that conversation out loud tonight. And we've made several. Points. We're going to move on to the COVID nineteen situation with respect to Bain communities now, and um, we know that Bain communities are dying two to four times the rate that white people are dying of COVID nineteen, which is just it is a staggering statistic when you start thinking about the numbers of that it gets even scarier so i wanted to have a broader debate on why how what you know why is this happening but secondly several times on this call tonight we have referenced being spat at and and the spit being a particularly sort of visceral form of racist attack um, it's happened to me. I've I've not been spat on on my body, but I've been like next to my foot. I've been spat at as a as a sort of way of having that happen. And we've now lost um, Belly Mujinga, who was a transport worker. She's you know train ticket officer. She begged her bosses. She had a respiratory illness anyway. Begged to stay in the ticket office. She gets put out on the concourse, and somebody spits on her, and she's now dead. So she's left behind an 11 year old daughter, a husband, a family who loved her, and she doesn't get to live the rest of her life. And then I read today that we've now lost a brother. We've lost a sister, now we've lost a brother in London, taxi driver who was spat on by a passenger with COVID 19, and now he's died. So it feels like there's almost a new kind of racist attack. Not only are we more likely to die from this thing, but there are white people out there whose reaction to that is to, is to like spit at us when they know they've got COVID-19. Sorry, can They're I just- I'm terrified. I'm gonna, I'll just, cause I've got to go in a minute as well. Cause I'm just- Yeah, go and say. Got, but the last thing I've got to say on this, literally about three or four weeks before the whole lockdown even started, I was in Luton's town centre doing some shopping. And there was a drunk guy walking through the town centre and he was literally screaming and shouting at people. And the only reason I even noticed him was because I could hear him from behind me. And he was shouting and screaming at people, running up to them, spitting at them and saying he's got COVID. And <sighs> notice this for a couple of minutes. And this was like way before anything to talk about the Bain community or anything like that. It was just a drunk guy walking through the town, spitting at people and saying he's got COVID just because of the joke of it. And this went on for about two or three minutes. And I ended up seeing a couple of policemen inside uh, the boot store, ended up going to speak to them saying, can you see what's going on outside here? Can you please go and deal with this guy? And because he's scaring kids and everything, he was walking up to children, women, and everything. Do you know what I mean? It was a joke. And this went on for like a good 10 minutes. Do you know what I mean? But what's going on right now is that th th people have weaponized spitting because of COVID the same way they've weaponized acid and things like that. Like, and it's just as a, a different utensil like that. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's a different weapon to be able to use just to scare people. And right now, everyone is so scared of COVID. Yeah. You, you, you can breathe other people and people, uh, people think you've assaulted them. So, you can't even stand too close to people right now. So if you're going to spit at someone, and uh, uh, did you see the incident that happened in Luton Town a few weeks ago with the kid that spat at the policeman? Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's all right. Yeah. This, this, this has been going on all over the country. Do you know what I mean? So uh, 
it's just part of people's attitudes there because of, of, of how disgusting people's attitudes are anyway. Do you know what I mean? So I don't think this is anything that's going to be, and we can battle this or do or contend with it in any way at all because people are just disgusting anyway and they'll do what they want to do to get the attention they want to do it. You're soon going to get people doing it just on their Snapchat or their Facebook just to get attention. Yes, yeah, it's going to be the new happy slapping, isn't it? It will be happy slapping, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Forgot about it. It's grim. I mean, we've got a laugh. It's like PTSD laughter. It's just like it, it we're is. in this ridiculous situation. <laughs> well, I've got to go now as well. Phoenix wants to say bye as well. Come say bye. Yeah, <laughs> bye, Phoenix. Bye. And bye, Sai. You guys right, have been bye -bye. awesome. Thank right, you thank for you, giving us your time. Yes. All right, thank you. I, I, wish, I wish I could stay longer as well, man. But next time, I'll be tuning in as well. Yeah, I'm right. All right. Thank you, guys. Take yeah. care, bud. Right, peace. I, I just wanted to. Um, say you obviously we we've been told the statistics that um b-a-m-e people a term that i still i'm not comfortable with but anyway yeah um, <laughs> uh, more likely in this country to to die from covid um and i think that dis the distinction between this country as opposed to africa and the caribbean <laughs> right Yes, is they, a die, huge... they die at a higher rate in racist countries. Right. And I, I, France, France right. had the same thing. They had more right. black people die and, and, and Muslims exactly. die. So I, I just needed to make that distinction because I think at the beginning of all of this, you know, there was this kind of thought amongst the black community that we were immune to it, which I thought was absolutely ridiculous. Um, and I knew it was only a matter of time that we were going to be literally on the front line in terms of soldiers f dying from this thing. Not because we're black, not because we our diets are so poor, not because we're dirtier or more unhygienic, but because of how we live and the jobs that we do, right? And for me, that is the only correlation. You know, I think in Jamaica, there's been seven deaths I think in Barbados there's been six, you know, so I think we just need to make that distinction because there are a lot of ignorant racist people out there mm. that actually are beginning to believe just like Ebola and HIV and AIDS, that this is a dirty disease that is being spread by non-white people, which is absolutely the wrong thing. We're dying in numbers because of the jobs that we do and how and and how we live, where we're being housed, how we're being Positive. housed. Yeah. Positive. And that is yeah. where racism comes in. I mean, it's not just on the issues that we've been raised, it's the subtle racism. You know, yeah. the fact that if you're black, you you're know, black, Joe, Joe Bloggs that reads the, the, the Sun newspaper doesn't know that distinction, right? They truly believe mm. that the reason why black people are falling and dying from this disease is because we don't eat the right foods and we're unclean people. And it's just, it just annoys me. I just wish there was, you know, it was explained. The reason why we're dying is because we're carers, we're nurses, you know, we're taxi drivers, we, we clean up, we, we're doing jobs that they don't want to do. And it just really, it just annoys me. The question you've got to ask is, the question you have to ask is how many rich uh, black people have died? In this? Well, and yeah, I mean- There's yeah. also the difference there, the rich and the poor. Right, Even the white people die. It's most of the poor. You know, well, you know, you have to be a bit careful of that because, of course, the first ten doctors to die, most of whom were consultants, were actually people of colour. Yeah. And they weren't they? You know, these are not poor people. These are people working on the front line. But actually, even that didn't tell you enough. I mean, I'm saying yeah. this because my daughter is a is a doctor, so I have these these intense conversations with her, as you would imagine, about what the risks are working in, working in this way. It's not just that. I mean, the figures are really interesting. So for example, I think it's something like, even up to, to consultant level, a black person working, whether they're a consultant or a cleaner in the NHS, is 30% less likely to make a complaint and to make a complaint about not being provided with proper protection. And they are less likely 
if they make that complaint, to be listened to. I was talking to my daughter actually uh, yesterday, and I'm not going to tell you where she's working, but because it would be really unfair to her. And she is just about to be moved onto the respiratory unit. She's pregnant and she's just about to be moved into the respiratory unit. And they do not have full protective cover still. And I said to her, you know, thinking about, because there are other reasons as well, as you know, why black people may be uh, dying more than others, which may have, if you like, genetic reasons. It might have to do with the level of melanin in the skin. There's, all, there's not been enough research done about this. But I said to her, given her background, given that she's pregnant, I said, what would happen if you said, I am not willing to go into that ward because I haven't got proper protection? And she just said to me, I couldn't. I couldn't. So, so yet what, again, being silenced. Yes. yes. So what you're talking about is actually somebody saying, even on the level of a doctor, even with her knowing what the risk is, that she doesn't actually feel she could refuse to go into that ward. So I think this is all a very complex yeah. issue. This is actually, you've touched on something there, Jackie, which I have, I have been considering, which is the two things. Like, there may well, when we get into the research of this, become scientific reasons that yeah. certain groups are more prone to die from this disease than others. But that research is going to take time. But what we know for absolute certain is that racism and the treatment of people in certain groups is putting them in harm's way. So what is the problem with getting on and tackling those things while the scientists are doing the work to, to find out about that? Because I'm thinking to myself, I always say, I don't, can you remember that, um, the guys behind South Park made that film years ago called, what was it like, Team America World Police or, or something like that? And there's this scene in it where they, they take the piss out of, a, out of a scene from Star Trek, not Star Trek, Star Wars. And they're like going into a war and they go, right, so it's Operation Cannon Fodder, and it's all the black soldiers. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, sat out first. And, like, and I'm laughing darkly, but it, I'm thinking to myself, how many situations do we know for a fact in different professions that black people are like the ring of steel that are sent out first on the front lines to protect, you know, in that high, racial hierarchy you were talking about, Jackie, like, you know, almost like if you imagine the colour scale, you know, that we'd then be sort of working back um, from. And, and that, to me, is a very plausible, possible accounting for why, even in higher skilled, higher paid professions, we are seeing the black people and the people of colour die first because they are being sent into the most dangerous situations with the least um, protective equipment in order to do it. No, but I mean, am know, I crazy? Or does no, that... That's, that's, right, that's, right. Right. that's frightening because if they're sending black and brown people in first, there isn't an army, there isn't a backup, is there? No. <laughs> I mean, what is the backup? No. And that, that's why none of this makes any sense to me. You know, it's a proven fact that the black and brown people that are being sent out in the front lines, I'm not saying that white people are not in the background, but the National Health Service could not be where it is today without black and brown people. So what is the point of... Oh, uh, yeah. Well, Once know, the, again, point, the point is, this is what structural racism is about. Yeah. So you have people of colour roughly, just roughly making up 3%, 4% of the whole population. But of course, and this, this was a point, the other point that I was going to answer about voting, concentrated very much in certain urban areas and in certain professions. So you, you have that going on and you also have that collision 
with structural racism, mm -hmm. which, which means all those things that I've talked about, about the unwillingness to complain, about the fact that they're very often given the worst jobs, that they, all of that. So you have this, this awful collision. Now, do I believe that this inquiry is going to come up with that kind of hard response? I believe it as much as the fact that Keir Starmer's report into the leaked uh, Labour report is actually going to fess up to the deep structural anti-black racism within the Labour Party. But that is the fact. We have an awful, a tragic collision between two things that in a way don't seem related, but are actually intimately connected with each other. Yeah. Does anyone else want to chime in on this issue? I mean, just on a slight side, but also about the racism taking this internationally, um, mm. being Palestinian, I can tell you, but they go on sometimes about how wonderful uh, the Israelis are dealing with the coronavirus. Mm. What they don't tell you in the news, you never see this on the BBC, the fact that the Israelis have been actively destroying field hospitals in the West Bank. They've been yep. the soldiers have been going on inside children's work and they 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 spit on they spit on, on the Palestinians and saying take this, you know, using it as a as a as a weapon. You know, I mean the racism in the colonial setting, which is which is the always the origins of the, of, of the racism we see today, is is alive and living absolutely in the open and well in in, in, in inside an apartheid Israel. And and you know people have to realise this this and when we look what's happening here we take that back here how black people are treated it's no surprise absolutely no surprise and and, and I think we have to have to fight it and I think it's going to be a fight a really strong fight that's so why I think there will be I think as you said black people are getting angry about all these things it's not going to go away and and when we say what's a new normal I think one of the things I like to see as a new normal is a very very strong active black black uh, organisation that goes out go out together. And we, we, with, 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 with uh, uh, Caribbean, Muslim, uh, Arab, all of us together, and one one thing. And we not we all have differences. We've got different priorities, but that doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. One thing, and that is the fact: racism, wherever it, it, it raises its head, and no one should be given any hiding place. Thank you, Tariq. Okay, I think it might actually be a good moment to move into our section on the impacts of a decade of austerity here, because I think each, both these first sections, we have ended up coming to the fundamental issue of this, which is structural racism. It's not just the being called a name in the street or, you know, walking in a shop and being tailed around by security. Those are sort of the overt racist acts that, you know, maybe quite a lot of people would agree with us that it, that still exists in this country. But I don't know about you, but it is much harder to convince people that structural racism exists in this country. There's this sort of, I think it bleeds actually quite nicely into that sort of English exceptionalism, that like, you know, this is the most advanced culture, we're the most anti-racist, you know, country, and almost even the reporting, the, the description of this country as structurally racist is like an attack on Britain um, right. and Britain's sort of sense of self. So my question to you is, how has 10 years and just more, really, of austerity, because, you know, Blair's neoliberalism wasn't, you know, a paradise for people of colour either. What have been the impacts? Well, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to start on that. I mean, whenever you have people on the bottom of a pile, Whenever there's a constraint, they're the ones who are going to feel it. And just like, you know, we see it in COVID, we saw it during that time of so-called austerity. I don't actually think we should call it austerity because it wasn't austerity for many people. If you look at the rich list, the rich did very well out of it. You know, look at what happened to the private wealth of the royal family. Look at what happened to the private wealth of the top 100. What it was was redistribution of wealth from the poorest <laughs> riches. You know, that's what it was. So can we, you know, it wasn't, it's again this whole thing that they like to do, that we're all in it together. Well, just <laughs> like, if I heard that once more in the COVID thing, we are not all in this together. 
and actually withdrawing funding from services, which is again something that is disproportionately staffed by minorities and disproportionately used by minorities, is bound to increase the structural racism. And I also think this is another thing I want to um, say about what's happened. I'm going to link it with our first conversation, the whole anti-Semitism uh, nonsense drivel that has, has been obsessing people. And it, it's one part of the damage that has happened, is that we have forgotten. We have forgotten that actually there is evidence and that there is power in evidence and that there hasn't been one shred of evidence of racism uh, structurally against Jews in the Labour Party. But there is evidence of the exclusion of people of colour and of Muslims from the Labour Party. So I think what we want to do in this age of Trumpian anti-evidence mm actually foreground evidence. Yeah. We should be asking the Labour Party to start keeping data on the people of colour and minorities. We should be asking for evidence and we should start owning evidence again. And there's reasons why they don't want to talk about evidence because then they can just make it up as they go along. It, you know, this redistribution of wealth has hurt the poorest the most. Yeah. And that's why people of colour have been hurt the most, because they are disproportionately within that group. Yeah, I think, I mean, there's some interesting points there, Jackie. One thing I was thinking as well, just a side, but when you're talking about the evidence and, and putting out, out the, the arguments, um, I think there is an opportunity here because... Okay, call it whatever we call it. It's called austerity because most people recognise what it is. Certainly on the left, they do. Um, the fight austerity, and as it gives us, is is where the black working class and the white working class can actually come together, and that's a very important thing because they are all, you know, the poor are hit, and and yes, black people have it worse in a lot of ways for many many reasons. But if you're a poor white person, and there are a lot of them, millions, mm -hmm. right? You know, they are suffering just as much. With, 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 with the policies we've seen and the whole structure of, of that neoliberalism and, and what it means for the poor. And, and as you said, the, the distribution of wealth to the rich. And you'll notice the rich, uh, you know, also, you know, uh, uh, um, don't give two hoots about, about the, the poor ever. So there is a un uniting force there and it can actually be used, I think, to show people. And, and there's a lot to do. There's a lot of things to do and it's not as simple as all this, but, but this does give us opportunity to start showing a unity between black and white working class people and, uh, and beginning to sit, discuss racism among the white people so they begin to understand. I know it's happened in a lot of places where, I mean, I remember the miners' strike. I don't know, I mean, some of you might, might not be involved. We, are, we were very, very much involved here in Luton and had people here staying and, and got went to, to, to rallies. And talking to them, how they became, for example, understanding the Irish question from, from, mm -hmm. from Sinn Féin's point of view. They started understanding colonialism. Uh, the situation in Palestine, I remember having to be openly saying before the minor strike, they never had two thoughts about it. Once they were in struggle, once they were fighting together, they suddenly recognized it. These were white working class miners. Okay, so I mean, I think there's an opportunity. How? I don't know. We need to discuss that more and we need to build. I think we need to build that the organization of black, but we also have a fight against austerity. Let's call it austerity because that's what's recognized. Taking on the point you made, Jackie, quite quite well made. I think we can we can move forward. Thanks, Tarek. Fiona. Um, on a local level, it's clear, right? And I don't want to kind of link crime to black people per se, but obviously, where there's a lack of hope, and there's mm. lack of resources, and a line in resources people are gonna try and get money and hope from other sources right so obviously in the last time 10 years it's been harder you know my son is 19 my my, my daughter is 15 
um, when I see the decline in the high school that they that won, they both went to the same high school. When I see the decline in education in that school in the last eight years, it's it's mind blowing. Um, I think if kids don't have any hope and they don't have a good education in these times, then what are they going to do? You know, we've lost the whole university fee structure has changed mm-hmm. dramatically. You know, I'm all for entrepreneurship. I'm also into higher education. Yeah. I think a lot of our youth, black, white, working class youth have literally lost hope. That mm-hmm. frightens me. So, you know, from that standpoint, austerity has had a major impact on our young people from an education standpoint, from a social standpoint, what are these young people supposed to be doing? Furthermore, when COVID does end and it will end, you know, our kids have been at home for months now. What is gonna happen to this generation of children who are having to share laptops if they have a laptop? There's gonna be a made, they're gonna be millions of children in this country that are not going to be able to catch up we don't seem to be talking about that and by me saying that I'm not saying that we should rush all our children back into schools I'm not saying that because I for one will not be sending my daughter back to school until she until I feel comfortable enough but you know we're we're privileged in our in our house where we have multiple devices so I can work from home she can log on and do her schoolwork. But the, the reality of the situation is a lot of there are a lot of children in this country that don't have those provisions. And at the same time, even though the schools are open for vulnerable children, for whatever reason, they're not taking up that then parents are not sending the, those children to school. So I'm, I'm frightened. Yeah. I'm frightened because from, a, you know, from an education standpoint, I think our kids were suffering post COVID. I just don't see how a large amount of children are going to be able to keep up. There's also, sorry, from this post-COVID thing, I think you've really got a point because they're already talking about austerity again. Right. Already talking about it. They are already talking about freezing the wages of people involved in the, in um, the public sector, which of course disproportionately affects people of colour and the poorest as well. So it's already started. And that is a battleground. And I think what we've just seen in the success in Parliament of getting rid of that £400 surcharge, which actually Jeremy Corbyn spoke about before Starmer did, you know, with his rapier ability to talk question. If I hear anybody saying that forensic again, I think I'll go absolutely mental. I find it so boring. I almost fall asleep when he's talking. But anyway, don't start me on that. Don't start me on that. But I think how to um, push back against that would be that link between the disproportionate effect COVID has had, the disproportionate proportionate contribution that people of colour have made and that is I think should be part of the pushback against the attempts that will be made to claw back money from the poorest people. I think there's an opportunity there because I I agree with you there will be actually a backlash if they try and do austerity. I think it's no surprise why Boris is the ever populist is going around saying, no, there'll be no posterity, no austerity, we're going back to that. It's because he knows if he does say the opposite, he'll be slaughtered. And he's already in a bad position when, when the, the review what happened and how they how incompetent they were. And I think this will be the death knell. There'll be splits in the Tory party as they get scared that they're going to lose their seats. There's going to be, you know, so I think the opportunity there. Ultimately, ultimately, you know, I think... I know what the, the the fear you have about, about the education of youth, but I think I think young people, very young people, are much more flexible, adaptable, and and and, and can can move on on these things. It is a problem with with the disparity between the rich and the poor, or the richer and the poorer, or not able to get onto online or whatever, have the, the laptops, uh, and, and able to get the education. But it is a very small time. I think they'll be going back. 
by next September, whatever. And what they've lost, okay, they've lost the term, but I don't think kids are so vulnerable in themselves always that they won't find a way. And if, actually, well, what's happened, I reckon a lot of them have learned, especially the teenagers, would have learned a lot about the lies of the government and the way things work and the way capitalism is not a solution, can't give them a job, mm -hmm. can't guarantee things, and will be very open to the ideas. And I think you might see a resurgence of the sort of the youth movements you had in the past uh, after this. And I wouldn't be surprised. I think that's, that's certainly my hope, Tarek, is that experiencing capitalism in crisis, the number of times that millennials, Gen Z, and even blue Gen Z have experienced, I think, you know, part of the reason people don't, you know, aren't as receptive to ideas outside of capitalism is one, they don't hear about them and they don't understand them. And two, everyone is scared of change. And you would think the less someone has, the more open to change they'd be. But sometimes it's the opposite because you think, I've already got so little, I can't even imagine risking what little I have. But I do feel there is even a breaking point on that. As we have seen in the past, you know, even during the Industrial Revolution and, you know, in other times where, you know, working class people get together and form alliances, you know, intra-ethnic, inter-ethnic alliances where we go, right, that's it. All other issues are on the, we got to sort this out now. We have, you know, we've had enough. And I do think that those generations, you know, look at the prevalence of mental health issues, anxiety, depression, suicide is up 30, 30%. You know, is this is big, big impacts, and I think that that population, particularly given what's happened to them in recent elections, their experience of the destruction of Corbynism, you know, seeing this future that was so close, so close they could taste it, ripped away by a generation <laughs> that grew up with all of these protections, with the welfare state spent their whole adult lives getting rid of it for everyone but themselves and then voted against you know giving that same security to those younger generations so i do hope actually that, is, that they galvanize around that there is an interest i mean the the, the unions are seeing a, a large uh, influx of people uh, joining now uh, i certainly know from unite there's a there's a there's a quite a few most of those people are young uh, realizing they're losing jobs, that people on, in in the uh, you know the gig economy, and people realizing how unprotected they were, and 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 while other people all said, oh yeah yeah, but they also had the excuse why not to to, to pay the dues or whatever. And now they, uh, I think they're beginning to see it's not big enough yet, but it's beginning to happen, and that that campaign is very important. Get people into unions. Can I just say? I think oh yeah, go Jackie. Just one last thing. I think the problem with the present Labour Party leadership is that they are not the ones who are going to push back on any austerity. They've already made that plain. And so I think the idea of having some kind of kind of grassroots sort of grouping that would be both anti-racist and anti-austerity, in a, in a way the kind of continuation uh, of the Corbyn project would be very good. But it would also have to actually speak to and against the Labour Party yeah. as well as the Tories, otherwise it would not have credibility. I think yeah. it would have to stand in a way that would actually to say to Yvette Cooper and to Keir Starmer, actually what you're talking is crap, you are talking crap. And you would also say, uh, you know, to the Tory party what you needed to say to them. And that might be a difficulty for some people. Uh, so maybe that is something that we need to think about. Yeah, I, I agree. I can't wait to have those conversations because I know we're going to have them. That's the best thing is this isn't pie in the sky stuff. We are going to have these conversations and make this happen. So I'm and conscious we're moving. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Sorry, I was just saying they will actually also happen inside the Labour Party. Uh, I know, think there's nothing against doing both. Nothing yeah, against doing both. I think nice. this is not an either or situation. But what I do think, particularly for our own mental health, actually, I think it's important that people are able to fight in the way they want to fight. And for some people, that will be in the Labour Party. But for other people, it will be like, I cannot continue to give my support to this party when it doesn't support me. So I'm going to use my energy 
in this other direction, which is actually ultimately going to end up being complementary because the end result will probably be the same, which will be a rise in the significance, the importance and the listening of and for black people, Muslims and other people of colour. And that, that's where we need to get to. So before we wrap up, because I'm conscious we're moving into the, the final minutes of this, I've got to say, extraordinary session. Like I, I am just lit up by getting to have this conversation out loud with my fellow people of colour, also with the audience that we've got listening to us right now. So we had a question from Avril, which I, I couldn't help but giggle at it. So I, I really do have to ask it and I'd love to hear your views. And it was, should Boris Johnson apologise for calling Muslim women letterboxes now that people are being asked to wear face coverings? <laughs> I think he should just resign. Yeah. Well, well of course, not... he apologise, no. but that whole, that whole apology thing, that was mm. just a thing about Corbyn. Nobody asked the Prime Minister, uh, the Tory Prime Minister or the Tories to apologise. They can say what they want. And that's the point, isn't it? Yeah. Well, I don't think he's going to apologise. He's not apologising for anything that he's doing now. So especially, you know, one thing I, I really want to talk about at some point this evening is about this 2016 summit where they did a, a dress rehearsal of a pandemic. So yeah. they should have been prepared for lockdown. He knew this was coming. He's still sticking to his story that he listened to the scientific evidence. Another one of those terms, that if I hear it one more time, I'm going to scream and rip my head wrap off. So no, he's not going to apologise for anything. You know what will happen at the end of it? It'll be the scientists who got it wrong, not, not Boris. Yeah, that's right. Oh, they're that's already why, on it. That's yeah. why they're not publishing the Sage uh, yeah. you know, advice, because obviously there's there's differences. And in the end, it's the government, the ministers, Boris, who makes the decisions of what happens. But yeah. look at the science. If the science doesn't agree with what he wants to do, well, he just ignores it. Yeah, I absolutely agree. I don't know about anyone else. But I'm sick of apologies, period. I don't, yeah. I don't want apologies. I want accountability exactly. and change. Like, yeah. That's the thing. It's like this whole framing of things around, oh, apologise. Apolo like, anyone can take two seconds and give a measly apology. Like, it, means, it ultimately means nothing if it doesn't come with accountability, a demonstration that somebody has learned something from that mistake. They have learned a new way of thinking. They realise that their actions and the belief systems behind them are not offensive. They're harmful. They hurt people. It's not about wounded feelings. It's about people getting sick, dying, never getting to self-actualise on this earth because they're being consistently repressed, oppressed, held back. You know, this is the issue. I think that's the problem with the whole liberal framing, actually, of racism, is that they go, well, we're not racist because we know all the right words. You know, right. we can say all the right little words for, for all the right people, but we still wouldn't employ a black person in our law firm. Right. You know, we, we still don't, we still don't, we still just have sort of a tokenistic little BAME, you know, mentoring group you know there's got two people in it and has done sod all you know to do anything else or we have a cabinet where we've got a person of color as home secretary who's putting through the most racist piece of legislation this country has seen in time yeah you know it's all just tokenistic performative nonsense which is more about this gaslighting where they are giving this veneer this impression of progress and people believe it who don't experience the sharp end of it being a lie. And, right. and that has us feel even more alone because while we experience the reality of things getting worse, other people are celebrating <laughs> the progress. <laughs> you know, I can remember I tweeted, um, I made a tweet complaining about the fact that, you know, you've got Pretty Patel, James Cleverly, and I called them turncoats of colour, which I think is actually a pretty restrained <laughs> criticism considering their behaviour, not just recently, but historically. And there was more anger 
from centrists and liberals about my tweet than there was about Windrush, Grenfell, the immigration yeah. bill, any of it, because it's inside their little world of offence. They went, oh, that might offend Pretty Patel and James Cleverly, and offence equals racism, therefore you, never mind the fact you're a woman of colour, you are a racist. You know, for me, the fact that I... Go for it, Tarek. I just say, for me, Pretty Patel is the proof that racism is a class issue. Right. Because, I mean, it just shows if you, if you become part of the bourgeoisie and you're, you're, you're part of that class, they're not interested in racism. They'll be more racist even if they have to be uh, to right. defend the class. And That's how you get in. That's how you more get dangerous. in. You know what? It's even more. I, you know what? Res, respect to Boris Johnson for calling black people pickaninnies. Respect to <laughs> Boris Johnson for calling Muslim women um, letterboxes because we know where he's coming from, right? Exactly. So I, I respect people that come yeah. out and say what they feel. I might not like them, but at least I know where you're coming from, yeah. right? For me, what is more dangerous is when you have people like Miss PP, yeah, because <laughs> I don't even know her name, yeah. <laughs> in her lovely throne oh and women God. just worship what she's saying because she's a woman of colour. So I yeah. actually respect Boris Johnson because I know where he's coming from. Yep. Yeah? Yeah. He's told he's, us from he says what he is. Pretty consistent. He's not an in inconsistent dude. He's been pretty consistent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we shouldn't be, of course we should be angry, but he, you know, he's not giving us any surprises, but Miss PP now, that's another story. I must remember to call her Miss PP. Miss PP. Perfect. Of what a PP is. <laughs> I just love it, Miss PP. <laughs> Miss PP. That's what I call her. <laughs> call her out, Miss PP. Oh, there's only some of the people listening that will really understand. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh man i've lost it i apologize okay we are in the home straight we have got four minutes so i'm going to ask each of you to give us a 60 second wrap up a message that you want to leave our viewers with this evening to kind of sum up it could be summing up the conversation or it could simply be you know a message of hope or a message of action um, let's begin with Tarek. Yeah, okay. I think I think the mission of hope is, is to build unity and, and, and action among the BME the community inside, outside the Labour Party, everywhere where they're where done. We've got to take an anti-imperialist position and really mm -hmm. focus on, especially, you know, the, 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 the BDS movement for Israel uh, and to defeat apartheid. We've still got to defeat apartheid. And uh, we have to move forward in, in, in uh, looking at ways to... To, to see what's happening, but advance where people can see that capitalism is a failure and that and that unity and, and class action and the difference way of organizing can be done, and especially for the youth to, 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 to encourage them to fight and, and, and come on the streets positively to fight against, against capitalism, against austerity, against all the things which, which the, this capitalist class uh, represent. Awesome. Fiona. Uh, look, I, I do a radio show and I say at the end of every radio show, we're one day closer to this thing coming to an end. Right. And I, I know we're losing people and we're all directly affected by this thing. But I absolutely believe that we're going to be changed for the better for this. I really hope that we're all going to be a little bit more uni. We're a lot more unified, regardless of what complexion we are who we choose to worship, who we choose to love. I just think, we, look, these people have shown us who, who they are. We need to start believing them and we need an alternative. So you unify people. That's all I can say, really. Thank you so much, Fiona. And to lead us out, Jackie Walker. Yeah, well, I just heard, by the way, this week that this year is due to be the hottest year ever recorded in the world. We've just had a pandemic. We just are on the verge of perhaps seeing the end of the world as we know it. We've got a criminally insane so-called leader of the so-called free world. 
We have the deep corruption of parties that are supposed to represent us and our interests. If now isn't the time to speak up and speak out and join in, I don't know when it is going to be. Awesome. I'm with you. I'd storm the barricades right now, frankly. I think we're all at that point. Um, and I just want to thank everyone, Fiona, Tarek, Jackie, and the organisers of the event for giving us this space to have this conversation, which is so important. Um, I have enjoyed every absolute minute of this thing. It has been an, it just actually quite cathartic for me personally. I know it probably has for you guys too. I hope it's been as fun to watch for you guys as viewers. Thank you for tuning in. And we're going to bring this thing to a close now. So Bye. that's us over. Shall I hand over to Freya? Bye. 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 Thank you all so much. That was, abs it was inspirational, incredible. It was, yeah, it was everything. Thank you, all, each and every one of you. Our pleasure.